Good morning, all. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Ms. Panagiotia Kakni will defend the academic thesis entitled Mind the Good Advancing Intestinal Organoid Technology. May I invite you, Ms. Candidate, to present a summary of your studies and a conclusion of your thesis in the next 15 minutes. I give you the word. Thank you. Good morning, dear Prorector, members of the committee, supervisors, family, and friends. It's a great pleasure to be here today and present you my PhD thesis entitled Mind the Gut, Advancing Intestinal Organoid Technology. Today, we will take a short trip through the gut and we will discuss different methods to develop 3D in vitro models uh, that recapitulate the in vivo intestine. But before that, let's first start with five fun facts about the, gut, the digestive system. Digestion is very important for your health, and I guess you can all agree with me that uh, problems with the digestive system can bring great discomfort in our daily life. The small intestine has a surprisingly large surface area which equals the size of a tennis court for an adult. Usually, we associate bacteria with negative effects, but in our digestive system, about 100 trillion bacteria reside, which have both positive and negative effects. Some of the enzymes that uh, we find in uh, laundry detergents uh, that are used to remove st uh, stains, you will be surprised, but they are the same as the ones found in your digestive system. And finally, the nervous system of the gut is equipped with its own reflexes and senses, and in this way, it can control the behavior of the gut independently of the brain. So considering the central role of the digestive system in human health, it is of great importance to develop uh, representative in vitro models that mimics as close as possible the in vivo tissues. Organoids are undoubtedly a groundbreaking achievement that revolutionized life science research. But what are organoids? Organoids are three-dimensional structures that uh, form through self-organization processes. Uh, they are composed of different cell types and they mimic uh, multiple properties of the in vivo tissues. Organoids are much more physiologically relevant system than 2D cultures and they can be derived from multiple sources including pluripotent stem cells, adult stem cells and biopsies. And finally, of course, they can be used for numerous applications. During the past 15 years, organoid models have been described uh, mimicking different tissues, including the stomach, the lungs, uh, the brain, the small and the large intestines. In this study, we decided to focus on uh, small intestinal organoids, which is one of the best well-established organoid models. Small intestinal organoids mimic the structural and functional characteristics of the in vivo intestine. They have a crypt villus architecture, which is uh, similar to what we see in the in vivo intestine. The cells are organizing into distinct apical and basolateral surfaces. And also in the organoids, we can find uh, the different cell types that are present in the intestine, including goblet cells, enteroendocrine cells, enterocytes, palmet cells, and stem cells. In regard to their functional properties, organoids have been found uh, possible to uh, mimic nutrient absorption, digestion. They form a physical barrier and they can greatly model host microbiome interactions. So there are also problems uh, with the use of organoids. For example, we have a great heterogeneity in terms of viability, size and shape not only between organoids uh, grown in different batches, but also between organoids within the same batch. Also, we have non-native microenvironment, meaning we don't have the surrounding tissues, we don't have uh, immune cells, we don't have vascular cells, and so on. And finally, the apical surface, which is responsible for multiple functions of the intestine, uh, including nutrient absorption, for example. In the organoids, they are in an enclosed position, and this makes it very difficult to gain access to it. So all this brings us to the aim of this thesis, which was the development of advanced uh, small intestinal organoid models, which can overcome some of current limitation and expand the range of applications of organoid models. The first model we described in this thesis was a microwell-based organoid model. 
Intestinal organoids are usually cultured surrounded by a viscous gel known as madrigel. And in order to expand them, every five to seven days, we break them in fragments and place them back in matrigel. Here you can see how starting from a fragment on day one, after five days of proliferation and differentiation, we end up in the, cre in the mature architecture, which is composed of creep villus structures that surround a central lumen where dead cells and other debris are accumulating. So in our case, we wanted to transfer this system to a microwave-based platform. And of course, you may now wonder why would that be of any use? Think of it as having ice cubes in a bag where they can stick to each other. It's difficult to pick one or two of them. And they, of course, end up with different sizes and shapes. On the other hand, we can have ice cubes in a tray where they are all the same. They remain in a fixed position through the, through the um, uh, freezing process, and you can easily pick one or two of them without uh, disrupting the rest. In a similar concept, we developed a microwell-based uh, platform for organoids. In this case, organoids uh, could be cultured for extended culture period. They had reduced heterogeneity. They remained in fixed position throughout the experiment. And of course, the advantage of our microwell platform is that it has very small uh, thickness and high transparency, and in this way, uh, we can perform in situ monitoring and high quality imaging throughout the whole culture. To assess the quality of organoids in microwells, we first evaluated the morphology of organoids um, when they were cultured in uh, microwells. And what we did see is that they uh, create these script villus structures, which is similar to both the organoids embedded in matrigel, but also to the in vivo tissue. The presence of different intestinal cell types is a crucial factor for the proper function of the intestine. And for this reason, we assessed whether these uh, cells are also present in the organoids. So for example, in uh, the left two images, you can see in green some stem cells and in red some panel cells. And on the right panel, we can see some enteroendocrine uh, cells in green, indicating the presence of uh, different cell types in our organoids. Formation and maintenance of epithelial polarity is another crucial factor for the proper function of the intestine. Here we demonstrated that organoids in microwaves maintain distinct apical basolateral polarity throughout the whole culture period. And uh, finally, we demonstrated also that uh, organoids uh, have an extended viability for up to 13 days when they are cultured in microwaves, whereas when they are embedded in matrigel, they usually require five to seven days and afterwards you need to pass as them. This can also be clearly seen in the graph where in every time point, the organoids embedded in matrigel, which uh, correspond to the black bars, are always higher. Uh, they have a high, much higher dead organoid area comparing to organoids grown in microwells. So now uh, we will uh, pass on to the next model we described in this series, which is a microwell-based uh, co-culture model of intestinal organoids and macrophages. As mentioned also before, in vivo, the intestinal epithelium is surrounded by other layers, where between others we have immune cells, vascular networks, and so on. However, as mentioned before, organoids lack this native microenvironment. So in an effort to overcome this shortcoming, uh, we used our microwell based uh, system and we added macrophages, which are key immune cells of the gastrointestinal tract. The microwell platform is a highly versatile system that allows for different positioning of the different cell types. And in our case, we studied two different configurations. In the first one, both the organoids and the, ma and the macrophages were placed inside the microwells. And in this way, they were in direct physical contact. And we found that this model resembled closer the later phases of intestinal inflammation. In the second configuration, we added the organoids in the microwells and the macrophages at the bottom of the well plate. In this way, the communication between the cell types was only performed by the secreted factors. And this model resembled closer earlier phases of inflammation. So what we generally concluded from this study is that the distance between the cell types is a very important factor when designing co-culture experiments. And also, co-cultures provide a more holistic approach to study inflammatory responses 
comparing to exogenous treatment of organoids with pro-inflammatory agents. The next model we will uh, discuss today is organoids with reversed orientation. Now we focus more in the inner surface of the intestinal epithelium, which faces the lumen. This is the apical surface where, where uh, apical junctions create a tight barrier and nutrient uptake, drug transport, and host microbiome interactions take place. One limitation for studying such functions in organoid models is that the apical surface is in an enclosed position. So for this reason, we developed organoids with reverse orientation. And what I mean by that, imagine a gene which is turned inside out. So for organoids with the apical surface facing the lumen, we embed the, organo the spheroids in matrigel. But to create organoids with reverse polarity, we uh, took Hingat spheroids and we captured them solely in suspension. Here you can see the microvilli, which are typical structures of the apical surface, facing the outer part of the organoids, indicating the polarity reversal. So uh, afterwards, we aim to assess the functionality of these organoids. Uh, the first uh, point of consideration was the barrier formation. On top, and for that we used uh, dextrin, which is a fluorescent molecule. On top, we can see that untreated organoids do not allow this uh, molecule to diffuse through the epithelium uh, because the, we do have a tight barrier formation. As a positive control, we use DDTA, which is an agent that disrupts the junctions. And we see that after treatment of organoids with that, the dextrin can really diffuse through the, matrigel, through the sorry, epithelium and reach the lumen. Next, we assessed uh, the nutrient uptake. In the in vivo intestine, the uh, um, uptake of fatty acids occurs mainly through apical transporters, which are located in the apical surface of the organoids, of the intestine. And here we saw that only when the apical surface is facing outside in the organoids with reversed orientation, the bodipidae, which is a fatty acid analog, uh, can be uptaken, indicating that the fatty acid transporters are really uh, dire directly accessible in the outer part of the organoids. The intestine is also responsible uh, for the uptake and metabolism of orally administered drugs. CYP3A4 is one of the most dominant and abundant drug metabolizing enzymes, and its expression can be induced by drugs like rifampicin and 125-dehydroxyvitamine or inhibited by drugs like verapamil and ivacaftor. Our results show that treatment of organoids with uh, such drugs can really induce or inhibit respectively the expression of CYP3A4. And what we concluded from that is that uh, we don't only have drug metabolizing enzymes present in our system, but they also show a form of activity. Finally, we expanded our apical out organoid model in hypoxia, which is very important since in vivo, the lumen of our intestine is a hypoxic environment and the majority of microorganisms residing there are anaerobic. So to test the functionality of organoids in terms of host microbiome interactions, we performed a triple co-culture of apical out organoids with two of the most abundant probiotic bacteria known as Lactobacillus casei and Bifidobacterium longum. And our results indicated that these bacteria can really successfully colonize the apical surface of uh, the organoids and exert their probiotic benefits. With that, I would like to close uh, my presentation by thanking, first of all, my supervisors, Dr. Stefan Gieselbrecht, Professor Roman Trickenmuller, and Professor Pamela Habibovic, all the collaborators and colleagues, uh, the committee, and all of you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Candidate. A very nice presentation, a good overview over the various chapters which are included in your thesis. And of course, this committee is rather eager now to ask you some questions. For the audience, we have five members in the committee, and one of the members will be online, is Professor Jonker, so you will see her later on the screen. So we're going to start with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the discussion, and the first member, the first opposition will be opened by Dr. Baumeister. 
He is Associate Professor at the Division of Toxicology at Wageningen University, and I would like to give him the word. Before, I'm also going to ask, thanking him, that he came all the way from Wageningen to Maastricht University. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, dear co-rector, dear candidate. Uh, congratulations uh, with the completion of your, of your thesis. Um, and of course, uh, it's always the first thing that you one, one looks at if you, if you get a thesis is the cover. Uh, and I must say that I liked your, your, your cover. Um, for me, it shows uh, the magic of complex cellular structures that organoids are. But there's also another thing I, I observe. You have two persons on your cover, uh, and perhaps, I'm not sure, perhaps it reflects also that working with complex cell cultures like you did, well, very much, as, as you showed in your presentation, and it's clear in your thesis, um, that ideally you should do this kind of work perhaps with more persons, because it's very labor intensive. So perhaps that's why you have two persons there, I'm not sure, because perhaps you can discuss that later. I'm also impressed by the very nice convocal pictures in your thesis, uh, and also there you have quite a few of them. But let's move on. Um, you have a, a set of propositions, uh, and I would like to, to start with discussing you, your first proposition. And perhaps you can ask one of your paranyms to, uh, to read it. Animal models do not accurately reflect the complexity and physiological responses of the human intestine. Thus, there is a great need for a representative and robust human in vitro models. Thank you. For me, two, two words stand out, uh, and I have questions on that. So that are complexity and physiological responses. So can you, can you tell me a little bit more, uh, yeah, what do you, why do you put the word complexity in, 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 this, in this proposition? Uh, what are the differences if I, between uh, um, the animal models uh, and, and humans in that sense? Esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and comments on my thesis and your question. Uh, indeed, um, seeing as a whole, all animal models are, of course, uh, a more complete model than an organoid model uh, when it comes to mimic some of the um, uh, responses, uh, since it has, of course, the whole uh, package. And organoids usually really reflect on one uh, tissue. Uh, but I think by really improving organoid models and based on their human origin, of course, we can uh, much closer uh, recapitulate what we can see in uh, humans and have, for example, more efficient drugs and so on, uh, and even better disease modeling uh, than using animal models. I agree with that, but that's not in your proposition. In your proposition, in my view, uh, you compare animal models and human intestine, and I read it, and correct me if I read it wrongly, uh, that you do not compare it with your organoids, but with real human intestines. And then I wonder, what could be the difference in complexity between a rodent or a pig uh, intestine in vivo and, and a human in vivo intestine? Because that's how I read your proposition. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, uh, the, the animal ones are much smaller then, of course, we have less microbiome, for example, and microbiome can, be, uh, can affect a lot of processes, metabolism, uh, our general health. Uh, so, yeah, even though the main functions of the intestine itself can be the same, uh, meaning uh, we do see everything uh, there as well, uh, I think Practical-wise, uh, there, there are also still differences. For example, we also have some um, microorganisms that for animal models are um, fine to be there, but for humans can be toxic, and they have end up in a disease or something. So, and this is, I think, a couple of things that we have already seen, but could be much more than that, uh, that we find out in the future. Yeah. Well, thank you for your explanation. I think we are. I'm, I'm understanding your point and on the same page. And I, I would say well, complexity. I do not necessarily see the difference, but in terms of physiology and the interaction with the microbiome, clearly there are differences between different species. Um, yeah. So, so thanks for your for your explanation. And if I then continue um, um, to first another proposition and then to 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 the, the more the content of your thesis. 
Uh, and it's a little bit in line uh, what we discussed. Um, let's see that it's proposition seven. So can you again ask one of your, the other paranym? <laughs> Because reduction is is often the key to unraveling intricate biological questions, in vitro models can be vital to scientific discovery. Can you, can you explain the, the, the proposition? Organoids are a reductionist model. I think it's one of the, um, uh, let's say, best examples of uh, reductioning and studying something very specific. Because, for example, as we did uh, in one of the chapters, adding the macrophages in the system, uh, we still miss a lot of complexity. It's still a reductionist model. Um, so generally, uh, and organoids makes it, uh, I think, a bit more difficult to perform some also more holistic approaches. For example, on cheap application, uh, we have peristal, we can have peristalsis like motions and at the same time co-culture and so on. But in organoids, trying to also keep it as simple as possible because they are already pretty complicated in culture and so on, adding components sometimes can be really uh, difficult and also uh, more difficult to understand uh, what is going on and you can miss your point. But on the other hand, you use organoids, it is a reductionist uh, model. Uh, you add one more component and you can really focus on studying one aspect at a time. Yeah, okay. It's fascinating that you call organoid models uh, reductionistic simple models uh, because in toxicology we try to reduce the use of animal testing and, and use cell line models quite often in, their, in our terminology sometimes organoid models are rather complex models. Um, and, and you already mentioned a little bit the co-culturing models. So if I would challenge you and look ahead, and if you would be back in, a, in, a, in an audience like this in 10 years' time, where would you then find that the organoids are? Would they still be used, or, or would you think of more co-culture? You mentioned the chips. What would, we, what would then be the, the, the state of the art? Yeah, I think if we consider of how organoids started from 2009, from uh, uh, Clever Slab, uh, just the organoids from mouse, and how we have ended up almost uh, 15 years afterwards, seeing forward 10 years, I think we will have, uh, they will still be used. Uh, but I can see them rather more complicated, uh, mimicking much more functions at the same time. Uh, but uh, I would say still not alone, but using maybe some more engineering approaches like on chip and more com combination of on chip uh, with uh, organoids as a rather complex uh, biological system, but still not as complex as we would like to see it uh, mimicking completely an in vivo situation. Okay. And then move to, to the more to the content of your thesis. Uh, I, I do have a, I have a question. I hope you have your thesis with you. Uh, on, on page uh, 50, 58, figure 6. <coughs> if I summarize it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you show there some, some gene expression uh, on, on, on several days. You have it, yeah, you have it in front of you seven uh, days, 10 days, and 30 days and then you express it on the y-axis as relative messenger RNA expression. And what, what I would have expected, uh, that over the different culturing days, you would see more of the more, of different, more differentiated cells. So for instance, uh, a, a higher expression, relatively speaking perhaps, of, of villain, for instance, or MAC2. But I don't see that. Uh, can you explain this, or do I misinterpret uh, your, your data? No, no, you are uh, right. Uh, but uh, if you notice, we already start by day five, day seven, which starting from the fragments on day one, we already have a full differentiation by day seven. Uh, so I wouldn't expect more also because this is a mouse model and we also didn't use different uh, uh, proliferation medium and differentiation medium. We were using constantly the same uh, medium uh, throughout the whole culture period. Um, I wouldn't expect them to become more mature because already we start by day seven and we consider them as mature. As, as a system, it was already considered mature by day seven. So I, I wouldn't expect more maturation to come over time because we also do see more uh, death. 
coming up in the culture rather than uh, more differentiation. If it was uh, maybe um, uh, a pluripotent stem cell derived model, then of course we could expect some extra maturation. Uh, but uh, with adult stem cell derives, I think, uh, especially the mouse ones, by this time, uh, usually they are fully mature. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so uh, I got warned that I should stop the discussion. Um, 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 but so basically, you say, uh, as a toxicologist, if I want to, want to screen chemicals, I could already use the model at day, five, day, day seven or perhaps even earlier, day, day five. Yeah, okay. Thank, thanks for your explanation. Uh, unfortunately, I have to return the word back to the co-rector. Uh. Thank you very much. Indeed, we have to proceed. I would like to uh, I would like to follow the discussion with Dr. Ranker. He was also a member of your assessment committee. He is affiliated with the Faculty of Engineering Science at the KU Leuven, and I also would like to thank him that he joins us all the way from Leuven, all the way to Maastricht this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, dear candidate, um, <clears throat> just to, to echo uh, my colleague, uh, I want to congratulate you on a really, really excellent thesis. Um, it demonstrates uh, tremendous work, perhaps even more than the two people on the cover, um, and and also multidisciplinarity. Um, so it's really spanning from engineering to basic biology to translational applications, and that's that's not easy. And you you've really shown something uh, that that you master uh, all of these elements. Um, so regarding the questions, so um, in both, I think your 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 mouse and human model system, um, you compare a full ECM conventional organoid model system with a highly reduced 5% and then I think even up to 2% matrix gel. Um, but as far as I understand, you, you, don't, you haven't done or you don't show a, a completely matrix gel free system. So my question is, have you tried that and if, and accessorily more broadly, what is the role of ECM components or matrix gel, whatever is in matrix gel, in terms of the this inversion of apical basal polarity? Thank you, esteemed opponent, for your nice words and compliments on my thesis and for your question. Uh, I had tried uh, completely removing matrix gel uh, when I did the microwell culture and it didn't work or at least in my hands, it didn't work, and they were, uh, the organoids were dying. Uh, and then, yeah, this is the mouse model, and then uh, going to the human, of course, we talk uh, about a completely different model that we start from pluripotent stem cells, uh, and then we went uh, still to 2% uh, for the polarity reversal, but uh, in a constant um, suspension culture. There, I didn't try to completely remove uh, matrigel, also because uh, starting the experiments, reversing the polarity was not my uh, goal, let's say, uh, and it is something more that uh, I realized in the process. Uh, so I didn't think of removing it completely because I think that even this 2% uh, gives some uh, signals that are very important for the cells to organize even with uh, reversed uh, orientation, uh, they still get some signals to uh, form uh, the structures. But it would be really interesting to see whether we could get the same or whether they could survive starting from him guts pharaohs towards intestinal organoids. This is already 28 days of culture, 28 days of culture without matrigel at all. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to follow up on that, so, um, Basal polarity is, is, it's easy to think that in, in con a conventional system, it's in contact with a, a, a gel adhesion, integrin signaling, and so you have basal polarity, right? And then the other side is apical. Um, and you, you very nicely show also you have these reversal from, from one, one system to another, where you show that when, if I'm not mistaken, when they are already basally polarized and it's they're quite robust they can't go back to the inside out um, yeah. whereas the other your system is much more plastic yeah um, so how does that in a sense what are your thoughts on how do, do you think this ap apical out is more of a default state for these kinds of organoids um, 
or why would it why would it not be 50 50 let's say why why are they almost all of them being apical i think for them it's also a shock to be uh that uh exposed because all their inside uh, that is usually inside is all exposed outside it's in constant contact with medium whatever you throw in the medium of course it's more responsive and i think that uh, we already have 2% of uh, material there and adding more uh, could really easily uh, f get the normal feeling for them to kind of close in the apical surface. So uh, I wouldn't call it default state because I think it's, it can be useful for a lot of applications and it is a very useful model. Uh, but I would guess that it's not their favorite state to be. So that's why very easily they can um, reverse back to their uh, basal out uh, polarity. Okay. Um, so we've spoken about apical basal polarity and then another feature of these intestinal organoids is um, the cryptovelli architecture. Um, from m many of the images in the thesis, it was not completely clear to me what is the, the role of this inversion of apico-basal polarity on crypt architecture. In some cases, and, and so in a conventional organoid, you have the, the um, uh, crypt basically coming, coming out and, then, and, and, and shedding cells to the inside. Here, it, can, you, can, you be, can you describe to me how you see the development of this, uh, the larger scale cytoarchitecture here and is it consistent? What I noticed through the culture is that they tend to be more compact. So we do see this uh, crypt velus um, architecture, and this is more uh, visible in the bright field images. But they tend to, instead of um, uh, branching out, they kind of branch inside, and you can see them more dense. I think they still exist, and I think that uh, the crypts uh, don't go out also because it's the proliferative stay, uh, compartment that is supposed to be the most protected uh, away from um, what's in contact with uh, the lumen. Uh, so they do branch inside, but it's something that uh, I would say it would be one of the nice the next things to check uh, how really the branching over time, uh, maybe with a live mm -hmm. imaging, for example, for some days you really see how they uh, branch inside in this case. But uh, for the moment, I don't, I cannot answer to you uh, with okay. at least my experience mm -hmm. and how I uh, grew the organoids, why they go more in the inside. Okay, thank you. Um, one final question, if I may. Um, uh, so um, related to this, so the, the uh, tip of the crypt, um, is that generally that's in the conventional organoids, that's a location where you see the, the LGR5 positive stem cells and the transit amplifying cells. Um, is that also the case in these apical, uh, the, in, in your inverted, let's call them organoids? And if so, where do, do they, are they, are these ultimately the shed cells that result from those proliferative cells, are they shed out to the medium? Do you see that? I have not seen what is said, also because it's a very long uh, culture, long term, and we didn't do any uh, live imaging. Uh, the position of the LGR5 is also something, I don't know, because we only checked with PCR and stem cells were more all around, but also because of the compact um, space, uh, the compact formation of the organoid, sometimes it's really difficult to understand where exactly uh, the color of the staining is uh, mm -hmm. placed. So it is something worth exploring, uh, especially also if you want to do toxicology studies, you want to know where are your yeah. stem cells, uh, but um, I cannot answer if they are if there are things setting, we okay. suppose that they are setting outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Moroni.
He was the chair of your assessment committee, and he is, a, he is affiliated as professor in biofabrication for regenerative medicine at our university, and I'd like to give him the word. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. you and your supervisory team uh, also for uh, the very interesting work you have collected in your thesis. And as a chair of the assessment committee, I can uh, guarantee you that this, uh, as you actually have, he have already heard from the other members, has uh, indeed uh, attracted a lot of interest, uh, uh, some remarks, uh, uh, but a lot of appreciation uh, overall on, uh, on uh, the content of the work you have done. Now, my questions actually alluded a little bit to what you have already discussed with the other two members, and uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, we talk a lot about team, right, with the two persons here helping you, and in fact, there are three persons here in uh, the Corona that have helped you uh, also across these years, um, maybe not necessarily hands-on in the lab, but certainly in the connection mind uh, and gut. Um, uh, and actually, the two paradigms have, have been uh, quite active today, so I'd like to keep uh, on, on with the, uh, with this interaction and ask one of the paranymphs to read statement number two. Organoids bridge the gap between traditional 2D culture systems and in vivo models. Thank you. Now, it's also not common that an assessment committee asks to read so many uh, statements, and it's therefore obvious that you have, we, we were very audacious on, uh, on your statement propositions. And I'd like, therefore, to, to ask you to comment a little bit on, um, you know, what, how really are the organoids that you have uh, made and used in your thesis so far away from 2D cultures and so close to an uh, in vivo model? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words uh, and your questions. Uh, I think uh, what we did uh, with this uh, study is that uh, we, in some points, uh, try to increase a bit the complexity of the model. For example, uh, adding the macrophages in the microwell system uh, really goes one step closer to the in vivo tissue where we do have the immune cells. And of course, organize the organoids themselves with all their properties, multicellular composition, structures, and so on, they are, of course, uh, a much better model than CACO2 cells, for example, or uh, for some applications, I will say, because uh, I would never call uh, CACO2 cells a useless model. Mm -hmm. I think it brings a lot in research and a lot in our knowledge. Uh, but I do think that uh, especially human organoids are a more representative model to study F human uh, in vivo. Fair enough. Uh, I'm sorry if I interrupt you, but I'd like to uh, engage a bit more in the dialogue. Um, so what other cells actually would you want to add if you would have another few years of uh, studying on this model? I would um, try also vascular cells. Um, I would also try different combinations of uh, immune cells. Uh, even though I have to say immunology, not my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very complicated, but uh, there are a lot to, there are really a lot to explore, and the interaction is uh, there, but uh, maybe I would start with the vascular cells. And why? To improve further the maturity and mm. the viability of organoids. Mm. You have a connection in your title with the, well, with the mind, let's say, which I think uh, a lot of us allude to the connection with, between gut and brain. In fact, actually, you have also mentioned that to, into your uh, uh, presentation. Would a neural component also be of interest? You mean cells-wise? Which vascular yeah. cells? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would start with uh, Huvex, uh, with human organoids. Uh, so more simple. Uh, in the... Um, in the cells, uh, com okay. meaning uh, endothelial, some endothelial cells, but keep the organoids as they are. And I guess also on the microbiome side, there would be probably quite a lot more to be. Yeah, exactly. Added. Especially there, I think uh, what would be the first nice thing to try is uh, isolate uh, some uh, human stool samples and co culture mm -hmm. them and really see what can go on there. So, so can we agree that uh, the statement number two is 
correct but probably a rather bold statement as it is written now. <laughs> hmm. Uh, yes and no. Right. I'll, I'll take the yes and no, and I think I, I know where you're going at uh, in, in both in both the positive and the negative side of the answer. Now, let me go back to then uh, the content of the thesis. Um, you have indeed this, you know, a nice uh, exploration of these two models, Basel out and uh, Apical out. Can you tell me which one of, well, you actually already told, but so considering also time, short answer, can you tell me which one of the two is the most physiologically representative? Uh, the basal out. Yeah, that's also what I thought I learned from your thesis. Uh, so, um, why actually then using the apical out? And I understand that indeed for practicalities you could have better access of the apical uh, layer, um, but there is a reason then if physiologically the apical layer is typically in and not out. Uh, and, and don't you think that maybe in that case you would need to challenge your system with drugs, with nutrients, with uh, physiological conditions like, like the hypoxic conditions used more in the native environment of the organoids? I think that in in vitro models, practicality is very important as well. And um, also, uh, if you consider uh, all the food and everything uh, we get in our intestine, it goes through the inside. But for example, if you want to do um, a drug testing in the microwells, um, meaning that wherever the basal side is out, it has to diffuse through matrigel, through the epithelium, and then you can really see uh, the absorption. Mm. But what would happen in your intestine, straight contact to apical side, uh, and you measure the absorption. Mm. So we still go away from the physiological relevance when we throw something from the outside, waiting to study something that comes from the inside. Uh, that's also true, that's also true. Um, now, let me move to my last couple of questions. Um, I was intrigued actually in chapter three, right, that you see with the, with the presence of macrophages, and if I remember correctly, also TNF-alpha as a soluble signal, that you have this kind of you know, roundness of uh, the organoids. So I might be completely wrong, but it's just more again a kind of almost peer-to-peer -peer, uh, discussion. Um, is this, do you think that this is also a kind of early uh, in onset of going from basal out to apical out, or am I completely in the wrong direction? I have to say that I didn't check it, so I can never say you are fully wrong. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I think it's more the effect of TNFA on the junctions that mm. uh, we have loosened uh, junctions uh, and then the epithelium uh, kind of uh, gets misshaped. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you would have to target a mechanism uh, of that uh, roundness morphology that would be related to? To the junctions and see what is exactly happening. Uh, or to maybe cell adhesion in principle. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, satisfied with uh, the answers. I give back the word to the Prorector. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued online. So for the audience, so we move to Professor Jonkers. She was also a member of your assessment committee and she is professor in gut health at our university and I'd like to give her the word. Professor Jonkers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Prorector. Dear candidate, I would like to congratulate you and your team with a really very interesting and excellent uh, thesis. And uh, looking back to your title, I really think that you brought uh, the intestinal organoid technology to a, to a next uh, level and that advanced the field. And I would be really keen to, to use the models uh, you developed. But I also have some, uh, some questions. And I actually first would like to discuss with you a bit further uh, your findings in chapter five, where you used the pluripotent uh, stem cells and created the uh, apical out organoids. I have to say, I'm very enthusiastic about uh, uh, them. I would be keen to use them. But uh, you already discussed that you are working on a small intestinal uh, organoid model, but then you actually differentiated 
those pluripotent uh, stem cells and different steps into hindgut spheroids. And I'm not an embryologist uh, expert, but I still remember that the hindgut uh, develops into the last part of the uh, colon and not the small intestine. So I was a bit confused by that. Why did you choose differentiation into hindgut and not midgut? And maybe first you can answer that question. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your uh, kind compliments and your questions. Uh, the protocol we followed was uh, the protocol from James Wells' uh, lab. And I think that uh, we usually use uh, the hindgut as uh, a wording, but the differentiation itself is mid hindgut. So I think it's kind of in between. And uh, we wanted to follow the protocol as it is uh, without changing this as well, where we already changed. We started from the spheroids and so on. So we wanted to keep the medium composition and the differentiation steps as they were. Oh, okay, okay. That already gives me a little bit of confidence because if I if I looked to your uh, uh, figure four on page 117, then, uh, for example, I look to this uh, lysozyme uh, expression, which uh, is uh, reflective for the pennate cells, uh, which are very uh, specific for the uh, uh, small intestine. And I saw the only coming up on, from day 30 onwards. So uh, uh, can you confirm that we are really looking to small intestine and that it's not, you know, uh, also, some large intestinal features we have, especially also in the beginning of that uh, period. How important is then the timing for your experiments? Uh, is that critical? So, can I be confident that I look to small intestinal organoids? I'm sorry, I don't think I got your question. Yeah, I look uh, uh, figure four, then you see that the lysozyme activity only comes up at day 30, and that is very specific for the small intestine. So maybe in the first days, it, is it then more also representative for large intestinal organoids, or can I not conclude that? Yes, that could be possible, but uh, could also be possible that they are not yet mature enough. So that's we also still keep them till at least day 30, till they reach till they um, uh, reach full maturation. So I wouldn't expect them to become first colonic and then uh, small intestinal. Uh, but we also didn't uh, make uh, any study uh, regarding to which fate, let's say, they had uh, in, in between on day 15, for example. But uh, or we, have, we didn't reach any conclusion uh, on day 15, let's say, because we already knew from uh, James Wells' protocol that we have maturation day 20, 30. Okay, and, and, and if you look to the different uh, cell types, because you checked the goblet cells and the pennate cells and the endocrine cells, I, I, is it possible to say that your model is more like the last part of the small intestine, like the ileum? or the duodenum, because there's some gradient between that. Is it possible to give some information on that? Yeah, I think it is possible. We, again, didn't uh, check which part exactly we had, which would be something that we should probably do, uh, especially considering the next chapter that we checked uh, drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters, which are in different parts differentially expressed. Uh, so I think this uh, should be done and confirmed in a way, uh, but in our study we did not um, uh, focus on really uh, identifying. Uh, we consider that with what we have, these are small intestinal organoids, but we didn't go through the real detail of which part of it it is. Okay, thank you very much, but I'm really happy that that uh, that uh, that you're quite uh, confident uh, on that. As I was also very happy to read that you quite often use IBD as an example uh, for the rational, uh, because as you know, I'm very interested in IBD and to learn a little bit more on the interaction between diet and microbiome. 
how that can uh, impact the epithelium. And and for me, it would be really great to be able to use that really like a for as a disease model. Uh, now, I also uh, we also know that IBD has a genetic uh, host susceptibility. A lot of genes are involved. Have do you have suggestions for me how I can make that uh, model more disease specific for IBD? Yeah, I think first of all, I would do the co-culture with human cells and maybe even with patient cells because there you can really do the co-culture and you can also try maybe some treatments that would work. But I think first uh, going into the human model uh, would be the first important step and uh, compare maybe a uh, patient uh, derived uh, organoids versus uh, control, let's say, um, healthy individual um, organoids. And then you can really see also uh, some genetic uh, traits being in your culture. Maybe one very short last question also given the time. If we, if we could do these uh, these nice models you did, the reverse model, the hypoxic tolerant model, etc. Do you expect them to be as robust with adult stem cells? Then the stem cells uh, yeah, I think the, what we also saw, because uh, the model for uh, human adult stem cell derived uh, reverse polar with reverse polarity it is already published. The mechanism is a bit different because otherwise also our organoids after seven days, they could reverse the polarity. But I think it will be possible. It already exists. Uh, maybe not in that long term, because I don't think you can keep uh, organoids with reverse orientation for so many days when they are uh, adult stem cell derived, but maybe for shorter term you can still do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. I'm happy to, uh, with that and give the word uh, back to the pro -rector. Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Castelli. He is professor in internal medicine and particularly gastrointestinal and liver diseases of our university and I'd like to give him the word. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prorector. Uh, first of all, dear candidate, I'd like to congr congratulate you with this excellent piece of work. I was very happy to see that it has a very innovative char character, and I think it will also help the field advance in terms of de developing in vitro models, which I think um, is a very important step, step in, in trying to understand interactions with gut-related uh, um, physiological responses. Um, so I would first like to go to you to chapter seven, and in chapter seven you, um, you look at a hypoxic model and try to understand uh, interactions with bacteria. Now uh, the gut is a, is a seemingly unfriendly place. First of all, there's no light in there, so it's very dark. Um, second, uh, there's practically no oxygen. And, and third, um, there are all kinds of bugs and other animals that you might not feel very comfortable with in being together with. So um, I think it's a very, very important aspect to keep in mind when you're looking at organoids and, and models. And um, I noticed that you incubated these bacteria at 5% oxygen. Is that correct? And and okay, okay, I'll, I'll just keep, 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 keep going for a second. And uh, I, I looked this actually up, um, and the 5% oxygen is more or less comparable to the oxygen levels in the submucosa. Whereas at the crypt lumen interface, there's about 2% oxygen, and in the lumen itself, it's about 0.4%. So there's just a bit, bit, a bit uh, air left, left there. But how does your model represent the real interaction in the lumen, or at least at the crib lumen interface? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind compliments and your question. Uh, to expand the bacteria, we kept them at 0% uh, oxygen. Uh, this is what uh, they like the most. Um, the lactobacillus is aerotolerant, so with a 5% was a bit better. Uh, Bifidobacterium was a bit more challenging when we transfer it with the 5% or with the organoids. But considering that uh, we kind of wanted the organoids to be happy as well, uh, we got uh, to choose the complicated system to be a bit happier with putting them in 5% than 0%. Uh, 
but I think this is something that uh, future-wise could be tested, at least the co-culture stage. So you can culture them in 5%, grow them, and then for the time being of the co-culture, which for us was 12 hours, you can also try to put them 0%. Uh, I would that expect probably, them to I'm be... I'm sorry to interrupt you yeah. for a second. So, so that probably means that you will have to... Uh, the viability of the organoid will be affected by the anoxic environment, whereas the viability of the bacteria is, 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 is necessary to have an anoxic state. So, so where could be the, 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 you know, the, the optimum level as to, as to keep, make sure that both elements are actually alive? Yeah, because uh, the, the bacteria themselves are already not particularly happy in the organoid medium, right? Um, I think... Uh, maybe putting them in 0% for a few hours, it would be uh, something viable for the organoids or not that devastating. Uh, it is definitely worth checking, uh, but I think it is also not something that would be viable for them for long-term assays, yeah. uh, which uh, I think already uh, you need to find a balance between how many bacteria you're going to put, how many hours, because if they start overgrowing as well, then you will end up with in a certain death. Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's some work to do there on that Oh, definitely, field. yes. Okay, so my, my next question is related to the, to the shape of these organoids, which is obviously spheroids, and, and the gut is generally a, a, a longitudinal organ with an open end and an open end in the beginning and an open end in the end. Uh, so so is, is there a, a way to modify your model in the sense that it represents this more anatomical shape of being longitudinal as only being spherical. Yeah, there was a couple of years ago, I think, a study from Matthias Luthor's lab that they did use a hydrogel shaped uh, with a crypt villi, and I think something similar could be done. Uh, so this was, I think, one of the most uh, well representative model, meaning both organoid cells, multicellular composition and so on, but structure wise, exactly, and uh, lumen open uh, both sides. Uh, I think they're open, um, there you wouldn't have apical surface out, but yeah, maybe you didn't need it anyway. Uh, but I think there are methods to do that. Okay, and do you think that's a, that's a sensible way to proceed, or, or is that not something that is very logical in terms of experimental or practical sense? Uh, I think it's a very nice model, uh, very useful. Uh, it's a bit more uh, difficult, I would say, in the production and make it widely available to people to use it because you will really have to make your own chip, okay. your hydrogel inside. So it's less, practical. it's less practical. I think it's less practical for, let's say, biology people and working, people working with that if you uh, have an engineer that can really build this up for you. Uh, I think this is uh, something okay. possible. And, and, and what about about movement because obviously the gut isn't static either and you alluded to that to in i think one of your answers so there is there a way to actually have these ideally longitudinal elements also move i think that's an ideal word <laughs> yes i think uh on a chip again yes but uh not on chip I think it's again something more difficult, or um, maybe with a co-culture or uh, with uh, muscle cells, that could also help and maybe a trigger. But simplified model incorporating everything, I think, is a bit more tricky to achieve. Yeah. So, so my last question to make even things even more complicated, um, you mentioned uh, adding different elements to this model. And you mentioned vascular elements to, to your answer to in your answer to Professor Moroni. Uh, what, what I'm as a clinician very interested in is the gut-brain interaction and the interaction with nervous elements. And you might be aware of of this um, novel cell type that was recently discovered, the neuropod cell. So that's basically an epithelial cell that makes direct contact with the nervous nervous uh, element, the nerve ending. Um, and you also alluded in your uh, introduction that there is the enteric nervous system and you had a nice figure that also showed the extrinsic efferents that actually go into the, into the, the, the enteric nervous system but also direct to the, the, to the gut. So vagal afferents, for instance, directly contact the epithelial cells. 
So, so what would be a way forward to actually, with your model, try to understand this type of interaction? I think, uh, yeah, doing a co-culture uh, would be the first step and setting up the whole culture, of course. But uh, yeah, maybe then uh, looking at the proton, uh, looking at uh, maybe the whole. Dear Miss Candidate, you are fully allowed to finish your answer if you want. If, if you say no, I don't want to, it's fine too. <laughs> it's up to you. No, no, I will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, even try to put in the different positions in the micro world, either in the bottom, and see, for example, whether we can have uh, branches uh, f connecting really with the epithelium. Um, maybe even RNA seq afterwards, see uh, the general uh, interaction, how it affects the organoids. I think lately there are and. Yeah, maybe some stimulations of the neurons, see the signals uh, transferring. I think we have the, there are means to uh, control the interaction, but uh, of course it's always a tricky uh, thing to see. I think you finalized your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dear Ms. Cockney, the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis, but in particularly the way you have defended your thesis this morning. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return to this room. Thank you very much. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because faith decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep part because we're taking off Get the Sight to the west side, 
No place like home if this question's how you've got Go the extra mile and die mm -hmm. Long road to the south side mm -hmm. Ten miles in my rearview mirror I know what it felt like mm -hmm. My goals only get you clearer East side to the west side mm -hmm. No place like home mm -hmm. if this question's how you've got
Dear Miss Candidate, dear Miss Cockney, the, um, the Greek committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and in addition, the quality of the thesis the way you have defended this this morning in the last hour. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the title of doctor. Professor, Habikovic is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university customs, and therefore I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible. Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Panagiota Kakni, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affix it with the official seal of the university. I would like to give now the word to Professor Gieberts, who is going to speak the laudatio. It's working, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Um, dear Dr. Panayota Kagni, dear Yota, it is my honor to be the first one to congratulate you on your hard-earned accomplishment in your successful PhD defense. And it is a great privilege for me to give this laudatio also on behalf of the whole team, as we have been working closely together for roughly five years. Well, to be precise, it was almost f exactly five years ago when we met the first time. Back then, when Pamela, Roman, and I invited you to visit Merlin for an interview and give a talk about your previous work. So this was at the end of 2017 when you applied for one of the PhD positions in Merlin. After your graduation in the program Integrative Neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh in 2017, you applied for a job opening in our institute. You conducted a research project on brain organoids and used organoids as a model for brain development. And you realized that the potential of organoids in research is huge, but you also understood that it would still need further improvement. However, you soon realized that we here at Merlin are not going to work on brain organoids, uh, which I believe would have been still your preferred model. But I think after some good discussions, we both agreed that it's probably less important which kind of model we use, but that it is more important or more about the methods to generate and culture organoids and how to improve those. I think we also agree that intestinal organoids as one of the best characterized models in the field at that time would be a good starting point. And to be honest, with its enteric nervous system, the intestine is often considered to be the second brain. So we were close to your ideal topic, but only close. Together with Francesca and Maria Gabriela, who I believe are both here today, 
you were interviewed for the link position on engineering organoids, and you gave a very nice presentation about your master thesis. During these first meetings, I never had doubts that you would be able to successfully finish a PhD, but I do remember that Pamela Roman and I were a bit puzzled in the beginning about your calm appearance, and whether you're really enthusiastic about doing a PhD thesis. But you definitely proved us wrong on this point. So in 2017, two days before Christmas, I believe, I received your email that you accept our offer and that you would like to start in February. And that's when our journey began. So starting a, a new project, and especially a four-year PhD project, can sometimes be intimidating. And there's a very nice quote, which I believe is an excellent metaphor, a metaphor for such situations. And the quote goes like this. I read somewhere that an empty room is an opportunity. So beginning a PhD can sometimes be very intim intimidating because you feel like you walk into an empty room. And especially when the topic is not about brain, but intestine. But an empty room provides also a lot of space. So new space to explore, space for creativity and joy. And it provides an opportunity to fill this room with your own new exciting knowledge and concepts. And this is exactly what you did. As I already mentioned, our journey started in 2018, and the journey was not always a piece of cake. It was a journey with many hiccups and bumps in the road, such as the cyber attack in December 2019, which then smoothly transitioned into the next crisis of the COVID pandemic, which hit us in 2020, and which made thing many things more difficult in the following years. Just a second. Um, but because of your diligence and commitment, you had already enough experience after the first two years to cope with these challenging situations. And hence, you managed very well. You have been incredibly productive despite the pandemic, which I cannot emphasize here enough. And although we see that these events have left some marks in the life of most of our PhD students and also staff, you were certainly one who grew even stronger in these difficult times. And when I look at you today, I see a young, motivated scientist who gets not easily thrown off the track. Your calm personality, resilience, and perseverance worked out very well and helped you to pursue and achieve your own goals. These traits became also very important as our initial ambitious goals turned out to be maybe too ambitious under these circumstances. But as it happens often, if one door closes, another opens. And you made a very exciting finding when optimizing your new 3D differentiation protocol, which allowed you to revert the polarity of small intestinal organoids and make the apical surface of the organoids accessible for many assays. Certainly, the main finding in your thesis, and from my perspective, an important step in organoid culture in general. This theme was then becoming immediately the new dominating story for the rest of your thesis, turning organoids inside out. This became the scientific foundation for the many publications that you successfully published in the last few months. Besides your tenacity and excellent lab skills, I think the whole team agrees that you were always an important link and please remember, she was on a link position. Between the different projects, methods, and characters in my team, you were always helpful in supporting people, and I received more than once feedback from students that you have uh, supervised in our labs, that you're an excellent teacher and trainer, so students always enjoyed it a lot working together with you. You were never complaining about the amount of work. Well, not fully true. <laughs> Sometimes you were complaining about this. But then you were going to the lab and doing the work anyway, and in most cases you did not stop until you could finish your thoroughly planned and executed experiments until we got an answer to the questions we had. Jota, you are a friendly, a very friendly, open-minded, humble, but also self-critical person, which are other traits which make it so pleasant to work with you. After these four to five years, I'm very proud to see that you became a full-grown independent scientist with an excellent working attitude. Beyond the excellent scientific work, you were also active in our Merlin community. So you helped, for example, to organize the Merlin PhD Symposium and the Merlin Boroughs, just to name a few of these activities. All in all, you have become a kind of scientist everyone would be happy to have in his or her lab. With this, I would like to get slowly come to an end. And on behalf of the promoter and whole supervision team, I would also like to thank Jota's family and friends for their support, which is I think an important factor that should not be underestimated, especially during difficult times like the pandemic, because that is what keeps us going and even allows us under such conditions to perform well. We would li also like to thank the members of the Defense and Assessment Committee for taking the time to go through the thesis and for being present today and to celebrate this day with us. Dear Otto, in the coming weeks ahead, you're facing probably the next step 
of your career, and most likely you will stand again in front of a new empty room, which might be again intimidating. However, remember and realize what you have learned and achieved in the last few years. I know that you can confidently walk into any empty room and fill it again with new meaningful and valuable things, whatever these things will be. So if you're wondering from whom the quote I read somewhere that an empty room is an opportunity is, this is actually a quote from the Emotion Joy and the famous Pixar movie Inside Out, uh, <laughs> a title, the way, by the way, that we could have chosen also for your thesis. Uh, and I hope that the Emotion Joy will, uh, will also be one of our, well, one of your most important driving force for the new adventures to come. So thank you very much, and I'll hand the word, word back to the Prorector. Dear Dr. Cockney, and I think it's the first time that, I, that somebody can call you Dr. Cockney, and I think the way your body language shows you really like that. So that's a good <laughs> point. I also would like to congratulate you on behalf of Master University, and I would like to also mention that I noticed that you did, uh, you, you did, and some some people from the corona mentioned that your work was very laborious. It needs a lot of work because you have to give your cells being alive all the time. And that, I was thinking, in the corona time, would be rather difficult to really keep your cells alive. And I really have to compliment you with this uh, personally. In, my addition, in addition, I would like to compliment and also send my congratulations to the promotion team, because it was uh, them, the three of them, who really helped you over these last four years. I also would like to thank the members of the corona to, uh, to be present here. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's just seven minutes, but it takes more time than seven minutes to prepare all the questions, and we should be aware of that. In my congratulations, I also bring forward the family. I think they came all the way from Thessaloniki, I suppose. <laughs> For your information, I was in Thessaloniki very recently on a thesis defense myself over there <laughs> to do it. One of my colleagues, Laszlos, over there, and it was a very nice city. I really was enjoying the city. For the students here, I would say you have seen today a very nice uh, thesis defense. It's something which we like to see with all of you too in the near future. So I'll, I hope to see you again by that time. By saying this, I think we have to come to closure. And for the closure, I use my hammer. You haven't seen it, but I can show you it's right here. <laughs> so I officially close the session and I would like to say, how do we proceed? There's a reception, and the reception can start right after, because the promotion team with the new young doctor will go to the stairs of our university and we make a group picture over there. You don't have to wait for that, so you can go already there and enjoy some typically, uh, I suppose, Dutch tradition in pie and coffee. <laughs> Even worse, there's beer, I suppose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So thank you very much, and I hope to see you there in about uh, five to ten minutes. Thank you very much.